In the introductory lecture, I mentioned that uh, the theoretical basis of uh, environmental economics is in the, in the welfare economics. So therefore, as the third theme of this course, uh, then uh, we will consider environmental issues from the perspective of the, of the welfare economics. And in this uh, first lesson of this theme, I will then introduce uh, some basics of, uh, of uh, welfare economics, starting from this uh, the first and the second fundamental theorem in welfare economics. So uh, an, a central concept that we will, will consider is the, is the Pareto efficiency. So we, we look at the economic efficiency from this kind of Pareto perspective, uh, uh, focusing on allocation of resources and in some sense also allocation of, uh, of um, outputs and then also all allocation of utility between different uh, uh, individuals. So we say that an allocation is uh, Pareto efficient if it is not possible to make one or more persons better off without making at least uh, one another person worse off. So that is relatively general definition of economic efficiency, but then it implies uh, three distinct conditions. So um, first of all, if you think about consumption, then, then we need to have, uh, uh, in some sense, rational consumers who are, who are maximizing their possibilities uh, uh, to, to uh, consume uh, different uh, goods and services. Otherwise, if there is somehow, somehow inefficient consumption, then it would be possible to improve uh, economic well-being of at least one person by, by eliminating this kind of consumption inefficiency. Now then also, this uh, Pareto efficiency requires that production is organized efficiently. So, so that uh, there is not some kind of waste of resources in the, in the production side. And uh, we can think about it as uh, that, uh, that if you have some profit maximizing firms, then, then uh, they will, they will uh, organize production in an efficient way. And then the third condition is here referred to as product mix efficiency, so that, uh, so that then this kind of uh, coordination between producers and consumers is also uh, efficient, uh, so that the resources are allocated to the, to the right kind of production, so we, the economy is producing the right things, uh, in some sense what the consumers need and what the consumers want to produce. And then... Uh, uh, we can think about, for example, competitive markets as an uh, as, uh, efficient way of organizing this kind of uh, information between consumers and producers and, uh, and ensuring that, uh, that firms produce the, the con uh, commodities that consumers want to consume. So uh, if you think about the textbook uh, of, of Permanent, uh, they, they characterize... Uh, uh, seven uh, different conditions uh, for what I would call an ideal market economy. So I will discuss these seven conditions in more detail uh, later, but for example, we need to assume that markets are perfectly competitive and, uh, and uh, consumers have well-behaved utility functions, producers have uh, well-behaved production functions, and so on and so on. I don't go to the details at this point, but I will come back to this list a little bit later. What I want to say at this point is that uh, these conditions uh, uh, characterize some kind of ideal market economy. You can think about some kind of like a model, model economy. So very often in, uh, in uh, economic models, we will talk about, for example, computable general equilibrium models a little bit later. So uh, this kind of model economy then typically uh, is building on these kind of kind of assumptions. Okay, so for example, that markets exist for all goods and services. So I will also later discuss then how and why these kind of conditions uh, might fail in the real world. But let's just for for a moment focus on this kind of uh, ideal model economy where these kind of assumptions are satisfied. So what can we then learn uh, if we consider this kind of, kind of um, 
model economy, which is somewhat simplified, but, uh, but has this kind of uh, uh, nice properties. So now I come to this uh, uh, fundamental theorems of welfare economists, welfare economics. So the first fundamental theorem states the following, that um, if you have a set of complete markets with complete information, then a competitive market equilibrium will result as a Pareto efficient allocation. Okay, so this is a quite, quite powerful result. So we know that if we have this kind of ideal uh, model economy with com complete and competitive uh, markets, then the market economy will, will result as a perfect, uh, or we, it will result as a Pareto efficient allocation. So there is not any kind of uh, uh, production opportunities or consumption uh, opportunities will not be wasted. And uh, there is also this kind of uh, information flow is efficient. So the producers uh, uh, produce what the consumers are uh, want to produce. So this is in some sense, one of these kind of reasons why, why we economists uh, believe that uh, um, competitive markets is an efficient way of organizing the, uh, organizing the the economy and, and that allocates resources efficiently. So a couple of points are worth noting about this result though. So firstly, it doesn't mean that, uh, that uh, this kind of allocation is necessarily unique. So I try to illustrate with these two figures that are taken from the, from the permanent al textbook. So the first, first uh, figure uh, is so-called called, uh, Edgeworth box diagram. So think about two consumers, A and B. So we have the origin of the individual B is over, over here in the, in the bottom left corner. And then on the other hand, the origin of person A is on the top right corner. So, so then in this figure, there is this curve C that goes like a diagonal from this origin of person B and origin of the person A that indicates this kind of uh, set of possible uh, allocations of, of uh, commodities. So think about also that we have two commodities, uh, X and Y. So, so in, if you think about this kind of, that the, the resources of the, of the economy are fixed and this production has been uh, done efficiently, so then the question just boils down to how these kind of ready commodities that have been produced are allocated uh, between these two individuals, A and B. So there, this, uh, this line C that is, uh, is passing here indicates this kind of possible allocation. So in some sense, if we give, uh, give more to person A, then it is away from person B because it's sometimes it's a zero sum a zero sum game in the sense that uh, that if we have this uh, uh, given amount of uh, commodities, then more person A gets, then less person B B can get. And uh, any point on this line line C is considered to be Pareto efficient because there it's not possible to improve the well being of person A without uh, uh, without uh, uh, decreasing uh, the well economic well-being of the other person. So you can see that the the Pareto efficient allocation it can be also also it is efficient in the sense that there is uh, not any any resources are wasted, but it can be also considered to be quite unfair that for example if you go to this uh, uh, point on this uh, this uh, over here which I indicate by arrow so. So here, for example, person A gets a lot of lot of uh, commodities, whereas person B is relatively poor and doesn't get almost anything. And then opposite is true here. If, if person B gets almost everything and, and person A gets almost, almost nothing. So then on this right side, there is another curve that also then, then indicates so-called utility possibilities frontier. So if we take these two commodities, and then if we have the utility functions of these two individuals, so we can in some sense aggregate these commodities to the resulting utility functions. So then 
here in this uh, this figure 5.5 uh, from the textbook uh, on the horizontal axis we have the utility level of person a and on the vertical axis we have utility level of person b so we can think about this kind of uh, uh, utility possibility frontier so so uh, if we take if we take this kind of Pareto efficient uh, allocations from this uh, left side figure and map them to this kind of two dimensional figure, then we can see that there is different kind of possibilities where this um, this uh, Pareto condition holds. So, for example, we can have this uh, this uh, uh, allocation uh, uh, Z. It's, it's on the on the frontier. So for example, if we start from the inefficient allocation R over here, okay, so this R would be inefficient because it would be possible to increase the well-being of, uh, of uh, both A and B, in fact, uh, or either one of them. So if, if the starting point is this kind of inefficient allocation indicated by this capital R, then it is possible to make so-called Pareto improvement so, so then it would be possible to increase the well-being of person A. So we could move from point R um, on the horizontal axis to towards point S on the frontier. So then the S would be this kind of point where, uh, where starting from R, we, we give more commodities and, and increase the economic well-being of person A, keeping uh, this uh, person B as, as, as well off as before. So therefore, moving from point R to point S would be so-called Pareto improvement. In the same sense, also moving from point R upwards towards point T is also Pareto, efficient, Pareto improvement in the sense that uh, we can considerably improve the economic well-being of person B in this case, keeping person A as, as well off as before. And then there's also this kind of point Z indeed, where both uh, both person A and person B would be better off than in this uh, in this initial point R. So of course, if this kind of Pareto improvements are possible, then then it would make sense to uh, try to utilize them and make both per persons uh, better off. But also the point of these figures is that uh, this par Pareto criterion doesn't really say what is the allocation that that would be best for the society so 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 it might be like uh, like uh, also highly unfair that uh, that uh, pareto efficient allocation might be also such that there's uh, one person is uh, extremely rich and uh, and can can have a lot of consumption opportunities whereas all everybody else is extremely poor and has very limited opportunities so so that that is still possible with this uh, this pareto criterion so if you want to do even more this kind of kind of uh, uh, welfare comparisons of course it's possible to introduce so-called uh, social welfare function which is then uh, here abbreviated as SWF so that would mean that we need to have some kind of uh, some kind of uh, uh, additional rule beyond this pareto efficiency that that we would somehow have to be able to aggregate these utility levels of the individual persons to the social level. So what is this kind of uh, uh, well-being of the society and how that depends on this individual level well-being. So in some sense, it's an aggregation rule. And uh, here is this kind of example where we have this kind of uh, uh, social welfare function W. So in this diagram, we have again this kind of utility possibility frontier and uh, to maximize the social welfare function, if that kind of function uh, exists and is well defined, then, then we would uh, then need to get to this uh, point B in this diagram where this kind of uh, indifference curve of the social welfare function is, uh, is, um, is, is that it reaches its highest level. So in some sense, if you think about this uh, uh, basic microeconomic theory, we have this kind of utility functions which are defined in the commodity space. And this utility function is giving the, the it, it represents the preferences of the, of the individual person. Then the social welfare function, you can think about it as a, a utility function of the society. 
but that's not in the commodity space, but rather it is, uh, as its arguments, we have this kind of utility levels of the individuals of the society. So in this simplified example, we have two persons, A and B. So the social welfare function then is, is aggregating these, these utility levels of these two individuals. And then if we have this kind of well-defined social welfare function, then it is possible to say that uh, what kind of allocation is, um, is, is best from the point of view of the society and what kind of allocation maximizes the social welfare. And then, of course, in that case, typically then we would have some kind of conditions that, uh, that, uh, that uh, we, we could take it also into account such issues as equity, that, uh, that it's not like, a, like a very highly unequal possibilities for the different individuals. And there is, of course, in, in social philosophy, there exists this kind of, uh, like, like Rawls has considered this kind of uh, criteria that what kind of the social welfare function should be. So, for example, the Rawls idea is that it should be, should be that kind of uh, uh, step function in the sense, or, or, or this kind of uh, indifference curve of the social welfare function would be L-shaped, that it would be the the social welfare function would be in some sense the minimum of, of all of the individuals in the in the society. So in some sense you would want to be make this uh, minimum utility as high as possible. That's one possibility to define the social welfare function. But usually in the welfare economics we, we don't really um, put so much emphasis on the social welfare function. That's more like a philosophical question. But then there is a very powerful result in this um, in this in the welfare economics. So I mentioned that uh, earlier that uh, the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics stated that uh, that uh, uh, competitive market equilibrium results as a Pareto efficient allocation. So there exists also the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics, which states the following that uh, according to the second theorem, then any Pareto efficient allocation can be supported as a competitive equilibrium for some initial set of endowments. Okay, so that also is, makes a very strong uh, case for the, for the competitive market economy, because if, we go, if I go quickly back to this previous figure, if we have this kind of uh, well-defined uh, social welfare function so in some sense if our politicians uh, know what kind of kind of uh, uh, result we want to want to achieve in the economy then uh, it is possible to to make some kind of initial reallocation of the resources so that we can then the market economy will will result to this desired outcome b in this example okay so i still now come back to this uh, this statement so if we have our 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 government has some kind of clear clear objective where where the economy uh, should go so what would be the efficient and social socially optimal allocation of resources and utility then it is possible to achieve that socially optimal allocation as a competitive market equilibrium in a competitive market it just needs that this uh, um, initial wealth, so to speak. So initial wealth, initial resources need to be just uh, reallocated in a suitable way. For example, using some kind of uh, taxation on subsidies. So if the government knows what is the what is the optimal allocation for the society, it can also then then uh, uh, reallocate the wealth and property and and then organize the production and consumption through competitive markets. So it's just enough to, to, to make some reallocation of the initial endowments. And then, then we can let the markets, uh, markets do this, uh, uh, do this uh, production, consumption, and, uh, and coordination decisions. So in that sense, these are two first, first and the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics makes a very strong case for the, for the competitive markets, that competitive markets are an extremely efficient way of uh, 
of allocating resources and in that sense also then maximizing the the economic well-being and if if, uh, if even this kind of uh, uh, if you think about fair and equi equitable allocation uh, markets can also achieve that provided that the initial set of uh, of uh, wealth is is uh, appropriately reallocated so that also then in some sense makes a case for the government to to influence this initial endowment so that uh, so that the government could just make take take care of this uh, initial allocation but then let the let the markets to to um, uh, make this uh, this uh, production consumption and allocation decisions but now of course it's important to stress that uh, that this is in this uh, under the ideal conditions of the of this kind of model economy that i st stated so i will come back to these seven different conditions uh, in the next lesson so it's the next topic of this course i will then uh, discuss the possibilities of the market failure and i come back to those seven conditions then in the in the next lesson see you there bye bye